This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Right, we got a walk-in freezer today, and it's not working, but the fans are running. But the customer said earlier the fans were not running. Interesting. Um, drain's always fun. Let's jump up and look at that temp control. Temperature controller. Looks like they've been playing with it. It's set wrong. It's 34 degrees in the box. It's set for negative 14, which is a bit cold. So negative 10, but still. That's not our problem. The coil's running. Let's turn it off and see if the, co the contactor coil, I mean the uh, solenoid valve is working. Turn it up real quick. Listen. There we go. Yeah, it clicked. Let's turn it back on. solenoid valve is calling again no ice so at this point we need to jump up onto the roof and see what we can find up there all right I pulled the cover off the condensing unit It is not running at all right now I always just like to see if the fan motors are stuck maybe it's a high pressure control okay at this point we're gonna start by checking voltage over here all right so we've got the compressor contactor power coming into the contactor 208, line 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 204, you know, I got to do this better, I always start by saying 208, okay, it actually has 204 volts, line 1 to 2 has 204 volts, line 2 to 3 has 204 volts, line 1 to 3 has 203 volts, I say 208 just because it's it's called 208 volt power, but in actuality I'm measuring 204. So we have three phase power coming into the contactor, which indicates that the fuses and the disconnect switch are all good, okay? Um, over here in the time clock, again, I understand the sequence of operation on this guy. So we're going to go from 1 to N, so that means we're powering the time clock, and then there's a jumper jumping over so now between n and four we should have 204 volts and we do that means the refrigeration circuit is calling this defrost clock is not in defrost for giggles let's go ahead and check between three and n and we get zero volts which is good that means that we're not sending power on the defrost circuit okay so the defrost clock is sending power downstairs to the coil the coil is running, which we know because the evaporator fan motors are on and the temp control was calling, okay? At this point, when the temp control calls, it should be opening the liquid line solenoid valve, which we hear it opening downstairs when I turned it on and off. We should be pushing refrigerant up through the suction side and it should turn on the low pressure control, okay? If there's refrigerant in the system. Um, basically, the system upstairs, or up here, is looking for the high pressure control to be closed, meaning that it didn't open, all right, and the low pressure control to be closed, basically. Um, so in that situation, we got to test at the compressor contactor and see if we have voltage at the contactor. I'm testing at the compressor contactor on the coil, and I do not have 208 volts going to the coil, okay? Let's take a look at the schematic and I'll show you. All right, so look in this, there's the way that Colpac or RDI, they're the same company, do their wiring for their compressor contactors always baffles me. I usually end up redoing it. But essentially what they're doing is they have uh, one leg coming off of line one, okay, right here. See how the wire right here jumps over, it does this little loop. That means there's no connection. But if you see right here, that is a connection point. That dot with multiple lines going to it is a connection point. So on line one, if you follow it over, it jumps over all of those. It goes into the high pressure control, comes out of the high pressure control, goes to the compressor contactor coil, okay? Now if you look at line three, we have another one of those right here. You see it goes multiple places. Line three jumps over everything, goes into the low pressure control, then comes out of the low pressure control, goes to the compressor contactor, okay? Now, while I was talking to you, all of a sudden, it turned on. Why? 
That's very interesting. Condenser fan motors are running and we have 208 volts all of the sudden at the compressor contactor coil. Why is the question? I need to put some service gauges on this guy. I don't know if it was off on a high pressure lockout or what. That's very interesting. There it goes, it just shut off. Very interesting. Okay, well I'm gonna put some gauges on because now we know there's a pressure control opening and closing or something. So we need to put gauges on here to figure out why it's doing that. Well, once I put gauges on there, and we see that we're at 382 PSI, we are more than likely shutting off on high head pressure right now. So, it's very interesting. With that being said, I wonder if that condenser coil is plugged up. It didn't look dirty. Interesting, or those condenser fan motors could be running in the wrong direction too. Let's, uh, because we know it's already turning on and off, so I can safely turn in or push in this contactor. Let's push this contactor in and see what happens to our refrigerant pressures and if the condenser fan motors are running in the right direction. Shouldn't be too hard. So what I'm gonna do is prop up these service gauges so we can see them a little bit better. Okay, there we go. Now I'm gonna push in the contactor. Let's see, okay, I turned it off real quick because I wanna make sure the condenser fan motors are spinning in the right direction. The frame rate messes things up, guys but they are both spinning in the right direction, both condenser fan motors, so that is good. Okay, that being said, I'm gonna push it in and let it operate for a bit. 400 PSI, that's pretty high, um, but it's not completely unheard of. On a 110 degree day, I would expect 400 PSI, but it is not a 110 degree day right now. So let's investigate that condenser and see how dirty it is. All right, this is a very misleading condenser because it looks clean, but internally it's plugged up. So we've got dirty condensers on these bad boys right now. So I'm gonna power it down. We're gonna get some cleaner up here and we're gonna get this guy cleaned up. All right, let's hit this guy with the hose and see what it looks like. Let's see if we gotta get cleaner out. It doesn't look very dirty to me. It's kinda coming through. Yeah, we're gonna have to get some cleaner in there. That doesn't look that bad as far as the water coming out. So we're gonna we're gonna clean it really good with some cleaner and see what that does for us. Alright, went ahead and used uh, the Viper condenser coil cleaner. Added a little bit, we're gonna dilute it with water and then spray it on. Alright, spray a little bit on from the front. And then Put a bunch in here, try not to get it on the motors. Put it in there. It's not gonna be perfect because I'm going at an angle and it's weird. But. Okay. And then uh, put a little bit more on up here. Make sure we get this nice and clear. We'll make sure we rinse it from the inside out. We'll let it sit for a few minutes, let it set, let it do its magic, and then, uh, now this isn't the, the crazy foaming cleaner either. This is just a normal condenser coil cleaner. It's actually micro-channel safe too, so you can spray it on micro-channel. I'm gonna spray from the inside out. Oops, doesn't look too bad. Coming out. All right, I'm gonna get in there and get it real good. I gotta turn the camera off to do that, so. Really dig this uh, one though. I always talk about this one. I picked one up at Lowe's. You can find them all over the place. But I like this one because it has a rubber head so it doesn't mess up the thing and you can change the settings on it. It's really easy, so super nice. My favorite is the shower. The shower setting tends to work like the best. Just, you're not doing nothing too crazy. It's just really nice. All right, we're all cleaned up. I put the motors back in. It was not horrendously dirty, that's what's interesting, but it was pretty plugged up when I had first looked at it. So we're gonna start this guy up and see what happens. Okay, so we're obviously running now, and uh, we're gonna watch these gauges and see what the pressures do. It's obviously really low right now because uh, the water's, it's a tube and fin condenser and the water's evaporating off the condenser right now. It's nice and cool blowing in my face, but once we uh, warm up, we'll see some real pressure. So I'm gonna let it run for a little while and then we'll follow up. So it's currently just about 90 degrees and uh, what we're looking like right now, which is looking pretty darn good. So we're gonna let it run for a little while, make sure the box comes down to temp 
or gets close. I, it was pretty warm in there, so I don't know that I'm gonna watch it completely satisfied, but I'm also, uh, if I can, I don't know if it will, I'll test the, well, no, I think we're good. I was gonna say I'll test the cutout, but I saw the cutout. And uh, notice the difference though, you can actually see through that condenser right now. You can see right through it, it's clean, so. It'll be much happier now. We're still looking really good. Temperature's about the same. Um, it's running real nice. I'm gonna go ahead and take my gauges off of it. I've just been working on cleaning up. I just got the hoses cleaned up. I'm gonna recommend, I went ahead and rinsed off this one and this one, but I didn't take them apart, but I don't think they're that bad. But um, the ACs are plugged, if you come over here. I just rinsed it real quick, but I mean, look at these things, but it's inside, it's embedded in there. And it's a coated coil too. Um, but that uh, Refrigeration Technologies Viper condensed coil cleaner will work perfect on that coated coil. Um, at least I use it. I don't know that it's actually rated for coated coils, but it'll work good on the micro channel. When it gets this dirty, you know, they say you only want to rinse them with water. You can't, I mean, you have to because it's grease. You know, these customers aren't doing normal maintenances, so it is what it is. But as far as the micro channel goes, the Viper cleaner is perfect. So. I'm going to start cleaning up right now, getting everything going, and then uh, we'll go down and check on the box town. All right, our system is coming down in temperature. It's going to be a little while. It's currently at 21 degrees, but it is cooling. Uh, it was pretty warm in this box. The ice cream is milk, so ice cream's done. When ice cream gets that soft, it, if it does refreeze, it's going to be gross because it'll just be rock hard. Um, but yeah, they know about it, so that's pretty much it. Um, everything else is still frozen, the chicken's still frozen, so they're good on that. All right, well, we're gonna wrap it up and uh, we'll just per uh, give them a call in the morning and do a follow up. Like I said, I'm on overtime, so I'm not gonna watch this thing come down. I have confidence it's working. This call was actually a couple, well, shoot, this call was like five months ago. This has been sitting in my archives because it hasn't been, I think this might have been like in May or something. Um, we got a call on the walk-in freezer, obviously, and this was an interesting one because when I first walked up, the condenser didn't look that dirty. It really didn't, but it was just inside. And you guys saw, too, that when I was spraying off the condenser, it didn't come out that dirty either. But in the end, if you see that those last couple shots when I was showing how you could see through the condenser, I had some shots in the beginning that you clearly couldn't see through the condenser. So it definitely was dirty, but I was also intrigued to know that you know it wasn't black coming out the condenser you know but it definitely took the viper hd cleaner to get in there and and push through and break down the grime and whatever with dirt and stuff that was in there so i really do like the viper cleaner because um, you don't have to worry about well the hd cleaner is the easy one because you don't have to worry about harming anything really it's just you know a great mixture of soap really um, occasionally on greasy situations like on that ac then also on another thing, it's been since like May and they still haven't had me clean that AC, but they also don't have people in the building. So that's a whole nother thing. But, um, but on that AC, the grease buildup they have on that, we would have to use the, the Viper blue cleaner, um, because, and then that stuff will break stuff down and you're not supposed to use the blue cleaner on micro channels. But when these customers, like I said in the video, when they don't do maintenance, sometimes you got to do what you got to do because if grease gets on those things, unless you have high pressure, hot water, you know, if you can get a hot water from the, um, the water heater, up on the roof, then you could do that. And maybe the grease would come off with just the hot water, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, another point that I wanted to make is, you know, you can't always just assume, you know, this one would have been really easy. Like I could see someone calling me and saying, yeah, the condenser's not dirty. I don't know why this is happening, but you got to get in there. You know, you gotta, you gotta look into it. And even I was kind of like, yeah, it doesn't look that dirty. But then once I cleaned it, it was like, oh yeah, it was dirty, you know? So you can't just assume just because on the surface, it looks shiny that all's good. You know, that one was plugged on the inside and, and it was causing that high pressure issue. Um, on these calls too, you know, sometimes we have to make, a, I have to make an educated decision like, Hey, I really don't want to stay here all night waiting for this thing to come down to temperature. Now I'm at a point where I've got enough experience that I feel like, and sometimes it can bite me in the butt too, but I feel like I'm I'm prepared to make those decisions like, hey, this thing's working. I'm seeing a reasonable drop in temperature, but those are the things that I'm looking for. But when I do that, I'm taking a risk by not watching the box come completely down to temperature. Keep in mind, though, too, sometimes the customer doesn't want you to watch it come down to temp. So that's why we document everything. And I try to make the customer feel like they're part of the decision making process. So I go to them and I say, hey, look, the box is dropping in temperature significantly. 
I am on overtime right now, so I'd highly suggest that you guys just monitor it through the night and call me back, okay, and let me know. There's a possibility that there could still be something wrong, but I don't think so. And making them part of that decision-making process, you know, then if if it doesn't come down to temperature, you know, or something happens, instead of them calling and saying, you were just here yesterday and it's still not working, you get the call of, you know what, kind of like you said, you were just here, but it's still kind of giving us some problems. Can you come back out? So it, it changes the dynamic of the return visit if you do have to go back. So you always want to keep the customer in the loop. At least that's what I train my guys to do is we were just having this conversation actually in the office the other morning was keeping the customer in the loop, making them feel like they're part of the decision making process. And when you're working with chain restaurants, and this is what I was exactly training my guys on when you're working with chain restaurants, in all honesty, the on-site manager really has almost no say in what you're doing in that restaurant. Okay. But, and that's the ones that I work in, but I still make the manager feel like he's part of the decision-making process, okay? Um, most of the time, I'm working for the facilities department, okay? And I've even had facilities managers basically tell me, don't even talk to the manager, which I can't do that because I still need to have a point of contact. So it's it's sometimes dealing with these chain restaurants, and especially in the ownership level that I'm in, you have to find a balance between your relationship with the on-site management and your relationship with the facilities department. So I always try to keep the managers involved. I don't ever make the managers feel like they're less than, you know, what they are or anything like that. But, you know, for the most part, I know what I can do and what I have to do in these restaurants, but I try to let them be part of that decision-making process, you know, to an extent. It's it's a fine balance too, because giving them too much decision-making power can also become a problem. Like I've had technicians call me and say, yeah, I talked to the manager and, uh, you know, it's kind of struggling, but uh, he says he wants me to come back in the morning when it's clearly not working, you know? And so that decision wasn't my technicians to make. And I have to pull him back and be like, no, 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 no. You don't tell the manager that, you know, like, so anyways, it's a fine balance. You need to talk to your bosses, your supervisors and figure out how they want you to handle those conversations. But I highly suggest that no matter what, even if you know, you're know you specifically working for the facilities directors, always try to maintain a good level of communication with the on-site management too. Keep them in the loop as to what's going on. Um, you know, especially like, for instance, you're working on ice machines, right? I've talked about this before. When you're working on ice machines, it looks like you're doing nothing while you're waiting for it to make ice. Wipe the machine down and communicate with the manager. Same thing goes for the walk-in freezer. If they want you to hang out or if you feel like you need to hang out and watch it come down to temp, talk to them. Explain to them, hey, you know what? I'm waiting for this to happen because da-da-da-da-da-da, okay? Anyways, I really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Um, Thank you guys so very much from the bottom of my heart. As we're coming towards the end of the new year, thank you. I just got to say thank you. It's been three years on YouTube, guys. Uh, I'm I'm so lucky and so fortunate and very humbled to see the amount of support that I get from you guys. For those of you that are making it to the end of these videos, it's it's just so cool. And thank you guys again from the bottom of my heart. You know, I just did that 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 uh, video, the Christmas video where I gave a bunch of people tools. I wish I could do more of that stuff because um, it's so awesome what you guys, the support that I get from you guys, okay? But again, thank you, and uh, we will catch you guys on the next one.